Let's open our Bibles to Isaiah chapter 14. What we're looking at this morning is how we each need to learn to resist our worst enemies. And our worst enemies are shown up in our text where we've been studying in Revelation 9. But the way we resist our worst enemies is using the key truths in the Bible of spiritual warfare. So first of all, let's introduce ourselves to this key enemy. Isaiah 14 contains for us what would be the, the introduction to Lucifer becoming Satan. And above all the angelic hosts of God, above the super powerful archangels, and we know Gabriel and Michael, and above the flaming fiery seraphim, and above all those mighty cherubim that surround God's throne, there was one angel that was above them all. And he is called Lucifer the son of the morning. And he went from being the highest and most powerful created being God ever made. In perfection, he became the arch enemy of God. And we call that the origin of Satan. The word Satan in Hebrew means the adversary. He is the one that opposes God. Well, Ezekiel gives us a description of what we're going to read in Isaiah, but doesn't as fully present it as we're going to see in, in Isaiah. But what Ezekiel tells us is that what took place in Lucifer's heart was his heart was lifted up because of his beauty. And you corrupted your wisdom by reason of splendor. And basically what we would say is that, that Lucifer began to, to be moved by his own beauty instead of God's and drawn to his own splendor instead of God's. And that pride is what got him. Well, the Old Testament Hebrew prophet Isaiah gives us this wording. And in Isaiah 14, we're going to read 12 through 15. What we're going to see is two things. In our text we've been studying in Revelation, there is an angel that falls from heaven to earth and unleashes a pit of the worst demons of the universe. In this text we're going to read in Isaiah 14, we're going to meet the angel that falls from heaven to earth. His name is Lucifer, becomes Satan. And we're going to hear about the pit that goes all the way through the Bible to Revelation 20. So Isaiah 14, if you got it, let's stand together for the reading of God's word. Remain standing. I'm going to read all the way down through verse 15. And as I read, notice the I wills. And I put them on the screen in front of you so that, so that you can see that. And basically, we see God recording what's going on inside of Satan's mind. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. Wow. The origin of Satan. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I pray that we would be warned by your word of the overwhelming, irresistible power of our flesh, of our self, of I, centered living, of pride. And how I pray that we will heed one of the clearest insights into spiritual warfare and that is to humble ourselves, to submit, to renounce anything of this proud, self-centered, self-assertive lifestyle that Satan imagined and then lived out. And we see the carnage and wreckage from it. So I pray that, that we would be stirred to resist Satan by resisting pride in our own hearts and by submitting to you. And we'll thank you for what you teach us as you illumine our hearts. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. As you're seated, I wrote the text, only I inserted in parentheses some thoughts for you to look at. Because what, what we see in Lucifer's life is this. That Lucifer became Satan because of this, this thought process that led him to rebellion. And the essence of it is self and pride. And basically, I will ascend is self-assertion. He is calling the shots. He's saying, I'm going to do this. This is what I'm going to do. Asserting himself as the ruler of his life. 
which is the opposite of what God wants for us. I will exalt my throne was him promoting himself, self-promotion. He said, I'm going to be above all the other angels of God. I, I am going to promote myself. It's kind of the go get it and for yourself. I will sit on the mount of the congregation. That's self-centeredness. If you remember, God is seated on the sides of the north. And the whole idea of his throne being there and what Satan is saying is, I want to be in the center. I want to be the center of everything too not just God. And then I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. He wanted to exalt himself. He wanted to magnify himself. And finally he says, I'm going to be like the Most High God. And that is, that is an amazing evidence of inspiration. If humans, if mere humans wrote the Bible, we would not have written, I will be like the Most High God. We would have said that Satan would have said, I'm going to be greater. But see, the evidence of inspiration is that this really happened and that Satan, even though he's proud and malignant and rebellious and everything else, he's also highly intelligent and he knows that God is greater than the sum of everything he has created and that existed. And so he knew that he's just one part of that creation. Satan knew that. And he knew that God is greater than the sum of everything, so he, one individual piece, could never be greater than God. But he said, I'm going to be like him. You know, that's one of our greatest temptations today because if you're a Christian, when you came to Christ, you bowed before him and said that he was the one who bought us and owns us, so he is God. And at that moment, the Lord becomes the highest, the greatest, the, the most important of all. He's kind of the top shelf of our life. And then we have lots of other shelves in life. But the longer we're Christians, what happens is we start putting other things on the top shelf with God. It's like, well, God, you're important, but so is my career, and so is my health, and so is my family, and so is my finances, and so is my entertainment, and so is my pleasure, and so is my... And we have all of these other things that crowd the preeminence of Christ out of our lives. And that's all Satan was doing is saying, I'm going to be up there in the same shelf with you. I want to be with, like you. And the Lord said, look at the end of it, yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, the grave, to the lowest depths of the pit. Now, let's turn to chapter 9 of Revelation. As you're turning there, I want to remind you of how dangerous uh, these self, self, self uh, assertions of the devil are. We should beware of any self-assertion, of any self-promotion, of any self-centeredness, of any self-exaltation and self-deception because each of these acts leads to pride and pride what is so dangerous about pride is pride makes us act independent of God now do you remember Isaiah earlier in chapter 6 told us the essence of sin all we like sheep have gone astray we've turned everyone to his own way you see the essence of sin is independence from God we don't need him we're gonna do it our way we're gonna run this ourselves. we're gonna live our life we're gonna Religion says we can save ourselves. If we do enough of this, it's going to outbalance our bad stuff and we're going to make it on our own. We don't need you, God. It's acting independent of God. And that is always sin. And sin is always horrible and has horrible consequences like Lucifer found. He became Satan. He went from the son of the morning to the adversary of God. And now, the pit. Look at chapter 9. And we've been looking at Revelation 9. But this sews together the, the two pieces. The origin of this one that fell from heaven to earth, the fall of Satan into sin and into rebellion. And then those that went with him, as we saw last week, the angels that disobeyed. And they are now incarcerated, many of them, in this place, this pit. But, but look at, at verses uh, 1 and 2. The fifth angel sounded, I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth, uh, the devil. To him was given the key. By the way, who gave it to him? Chapter 1 tells us Christ has the key to death and hell and to the grave. So Jesus gave it to him. And he takes this key, and look at that. It's a key to the bottomless pit, to the place he's headed. See, Satan is going, ultimately, to the bottomless pit. We're going to see that in a moment. Verse 2, he opened the bottomless pit. The smoke arose out of the pit, and it was smoke of the pit. 
so you notice how often this thing is repeated. This is a, a reminder from the Lord that God has a prison for rebel angels. And every time we see this, this pit, it has something to do with demons and the, the work of rebellion that's going on. If you keep going to verse 11 of the same chapter, you notice that it's mentioned again in verse 11. It says, the king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon. So there is a demon who is over the demons that are in this pit. If you keep going to chapter 17, a little bit further, go to the right in your Bibles, in Revelation chapter 17 and verse 8, notice it says, the beast you saw that was and is not will ascend out of the bottomless pit. Everything that has to do with the rebellion comes from this, this prison house of demons. Every time, seven times in the book of Revelation and one place outside of Revelation, that this word bottomless pit or pit of the abyss is used, it's always used for a place where demons are held. And, and if you keep going to chapter 20, you see what it, the fulfillment, Revelation 20 has the fulfillment of what it said in Isaiah 14 and verse 15 that we read at the beginning. And basically, look, look at what happens. I saw an angel coming down from heaven. By the way, I'll answer the question. Uh, so many people ask, they say, people say, is that Jesus? Is it, you know, when it, when it says in Revelation chapter 10, a mighty angel, you know, one foot on earth, one foot, you know, on the water, and, and now we have this mighty angel coming down, they always say, is that Jesus? Did you know Jesus is never portrayed as an angel in the book of Revelation? In fact, Jesus is not portrayed as an angel in the New Testament. Jesus was the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. Jesus is not an angel. So to help you understand Revelation, he's never an angel. Uh, and, and all those bright, shining faces are angels. It's not Christ. But this angel, not Christ, comes down from heaven, chapter 20, verse 1. He has the key to the bottomless pit, so Christ gave it to him because he holds that. And a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold of the dragon. Who is that? He's the serpent of old. Who is that? The devil. Who's that? Satan. So this, this rebel, Lucifer, become all of those. And bound him for a thousand years. Verse 3, and cast him into the bottomless pit. There's the same place, the pit of the abyss, the prison house for rebel angels. Basically, this is Satan's destiny, and he's going to be there, and then they're going to, you can read the rest, he's let out briefly, uh, and then he's finally thrown into the lake of fire. But we're not doing a demonology. What we're doing this morning is a Christology. Because the truth of the matter is that Jesus has defeated demons. And that we are not to ignore demons, nor are we to fear them. We are not to ignore the devil, nor are we to fear him. We are supposed to resist. We're supposed to know his strategies, and we're supposed to resist him. But to help us, Jesus authenticated himself. And turn back to the book of Luke, because we're going to read just about four or five verses there. The Gospel by Luke, and uh, chapter 4. And what I want to show you is how Jesus demonstrated who he was in the Gospels. Jesus authenticated. He, he showed people who he was in one way by his power over what they were so aware of, the powers of darkness, the demons, the, the evil spirits. And, and many of the people in the time of Christ and before had experienced these, the torments of these demons. And they were powerless before them. They, they didn't know what to do. And so when Jesus came, there was an unusual outpouring of the kingdom of darkness. And, and by the way, all of these demon scenes were intentionally precipitated and the Lord did this to show who he was. But in chapter 4 of Luke, starting in verse 33, what's amazing is this is Christ's first miracle recorded in Luke. And, and usually it's important, the first time Jesus reaches out in supernatural power and does something, it's for a purpose. And so Jesus is, is ministering along in Luke 4. And by the way, he was born in chapter 1 and 2, baptized in chapter 3. Already in chapter 4, before verse 33, he was tempted by the devil. Now he's going into the devil's realm and he is going to liberate people sitting in the darkness and the demons want to hinder him. And so the first thing we see is in verse 33. So Jesus is speaking in the synagogue and, and the people in verse 32 were already <laughs> astonished at his teaching. When Jesus taught, he didn't teach like all the other teachers. The other teacher says, well, Rabbi so-and-so says this and Rabbi so-and-so says this and I agree with them. And, and they just kind of, it was just kind of like a, a, a 
you know, kind of agreeing with the opinion of someone else's opinion. But Jesus came in and spoke authoritatively. See what it says in verse 32? They were astonished. His teaching for his word was with authority. He, he spoke like he was speaking the very word of God, and he was. And people were already astonished at that. Well, there was someone there, and, and this event, by the way, is in Mark's gospel. And, and it reminds me of what would happen in a lot of churches if Jesus Christ came. You know, there are 330,000 churches in America. Do you know how many of them don't even preach the gospel? They don't even believe in the inspiration of the Bible. They don't believe in the deity of Christ. They don't believe in the resurrection of Christ. They don't believe in the miracles. I don't know what they believe in. The only thing they have is a cross, and they're not even sure about that anymore. And, you know, I mean, and if Jesus came and preached there, it would astonish them. But there was, look at verse 33. Now, in the synagogue, there was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon. Now, we don't know, but it appears that this guy came to the synagogue. And he was able to cover, kind of like, you know, alcoholics can cover their alcoholism, and drug addicts can cover their drug addictions, and a lot of abusers can cover their abuse, and they kind of go through life, and everybody thinks they're okay, and they appear to be normal. This guy just appeared to be normal, even though at times in his life this demon was, was impelling him to do things. So he's sitting there with everybody else in the synagogue like this, and, and he sat through many synagogue services, probably, you know, counting the pillars and what everybody does, you know, because it's so boring. And all of a sudden he started listening, and this guy was speaking like no one ever spoke before, and all of a sudden the demon inside of him started looking out through his eyes, and all of a sudden the demon realized who the guest speaker was. You understand, that's what happened. See, demons are not omniscient, nor are they omnipresent, and they do sense things. They have a personality to them, and so this demon wasn't paying attention, and all of a sudden, the demon saw who the speaker was. And, and look what happens in verse 33. And he cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone! So there, there seems to have been more than one of them. And we know who you are. Uh, what do we have to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Now that must have been quite a service. You know, here's Jesus teaching along. <laughs> this guy screams and yells. At the, in fact, Mark says the word is kradzo, which doesn't mean to yell. It means to scream. I mean, have you ever been somewhere and someone screams and everyone freezes and looks? That's what's going on in the synagogue. And so Jesus, this is his first miracle, rebuked him saying, be quiet, come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him in their midst, wow. I mean, this guy is twisting and writhing and rolling around on the floor. And when the demon had thrown him in their midst, it came out of him and didn't hurt him. Wow. Well, that's the way to start your ministry. No one started paying attention. So look at verse 41. And the demons also came out of many. Every time Jesus, I mean, people started bringing all their troubled friends and, and they pushed them to the front of the crowd. And when they got near Jesus, look what happens in verse 41. The demons came out of many crying out and saying, you are the Christ, the Son of God. And he rebuking them did not allow them to speak for they knew he was the Christ. See, Jesus said, I don't, I don't need their affirmation, okay? You just see that I have power over the spirit world. And by the way, the demons are always totally uh, in dread fear. Look at chapter 6, verse 18. Another instance. And those as well who were tormented with unclean spirits and they were healed. So there were people that were tormented, the, the people that were just writhing with, with all of the demonism. Look at chapter 7 and verse 21. Uh, I mean, you could do this yourself. It's just fascinating to read this and just pull them out. In that very hour, he cured many, uh, Luke 7, 21, of infirmities. And the many is, is, is still um, affecting many with afflictions and many with evil spirits. See, this was a regular part of Christ's ministry, showing that he had defeated the power of Satan. And that, that, in fact, it says also in chapter 10 of Luke that while Jesus is doing this, Satan falls like lightning to the earth because he didn't like what was going on. Now, turn over to chapter 8. And, and this is fascinating insight into the women that followed Christ. It came to about pass afterward. He went through every city and village preaching and bringing glad tidings of the kingdom of God. By the way, that's the gospel Jesus preached. Repent. The kingdom of God has come. What is kingdom? It is rule. 
A kingdom has one main element, a king. See, we forget that. A lot of people just kind of want to add Jesus to their life. Being saved means making him and acknowledging him and yielding to him as king of the kingdom. And we are his subjects, his slaves. So he's preaching that kingdom message. And the 12 were with him. But look at verse 2. Certain women who had been healed of evil spirits. Those were the ones that were surrounding Christ. Those are the ones that were, uh, you know, the last ones at the cross and the first ones at the tomb. These out of whom he had, had delivered them of evil spirits and infirmities. And look, Mary, called Magdalene, had seven demons. I mean, she was a hyper-demonized person. Now, Let's get down to chapter 8, verse 26, because this is fascinating. This is the tie now between the pit we're looking at and these demons. And verse 26, and they sailed to the country of the Gadarenes, which is opposite Galilee. So they went, across, basically, they went from the west side of the Sea of Galilee to the east side of the Sea of Galilee, if you were on a map. And when he stepped out on the land, and, and what's amazing is, you know, Jesus went on this boat, the boat hit the shore. Jesus is stepping out of the shore, and he gets his foot on the shore. And look at this. A certain man from the city there met him who had demons for a long time. So this guy had been troubled a long time. But he wasn't able to hide out in the synagogue. This man was really troubled, and he wore no clothes, and he did not live in a house, but he lived in the graves. Kind of like the Halloween, you know setting that, that Americans love, the scary thing. But when he saw, verse 28, Jesus, he cried out, fell down before him, and with this loud voice, can you imagine, I mean, I, I see things in my mind, you know, I picture them. Can you imagine the other guys, you know, they're, they're winding up the, the ropes, they're putting the sail down. I mean, they just, they cross this boat for their whole life, I mean, this sea for their whole life, and they're doing all this, and Jesus is just stepping off, and all of a sudden, this bare naked man covered with scars comes up, runs up, throws himself down on the ground in front of Jesus, staring at him, and starts screaming. And look what he says. I'm sure they dropped the sail and their paddles and they were watching. What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. See, John 5 says, God the Father has delivered all judgment to Christ. Jesus is the judge. He is the ultimate judge before whom everyone is going to stand. Every human who's ever lived, from Adam to the last person in the millennium, every human that doesn't have their sins forgiven and dies with their sins on them will someday, with all their sins on them, stand in front of Jesus Christ. And every rebel demon, too. And they know they're going to be consigned. Hell, the lake of fire, wasn't made for people. It was made for Satan and his angels. The scriptures tell us that. And they know that's coming. And so he says, don't send me there yet. For he commanded the unclean spirit, verse 29, to come out of the man, for it had often seized him. That's what demons can do. And he was kept under guard. The, the people used to try and control this guy. They'd incarcerate him. They'd put him in the prison. And they would bind him with chains. A whole group of them would hold him down. And they'd stretch his arm out. And they'd put iron there. And they'd get their hammer. And they'd pound through a, 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 you know, a chain, a shackle. And they'd put it on with a chain. And they'd get him all chained up. And, and notice what it says. After they did all this chaining, and shackles that he would break the bonds. He just, it, Mark 5 says that, that he would break the shackles. What strength does it take to grab a shackle, a, a bound piece of metal, and tear it off of your own wrist? I mean, can you imagine how fearful this was to the people? And he was driven by the demons into the wilderness. And so verse 30, Jesus said to him, what is your name? And he said, Legion, because many demons had entered him. And they begged him. Now the whole chorus starts. I'm sure the boat, the people in the boat were just amazed at all this. They, that they begged him that he would not command them to go out into the, what does your Bible say? Yeah, there's where we are in Revelation 9. This prison house of the demons and this legion, which could be upwards of 6,000 of them, said, don't send us to jail yet. We don't want to wait there until it's time for the fire of hell. Don't send us yet. They begged and pleaded with him. So, basically, 
Let's do a, a very quick summary of what demons are like, and then we're going to look how to resist them. Number one, they're invisible. There's no record in the Bible of any form of demons. Demons go inside of things. They don't, they're, they're invisible. There's never a visible representation of them. They're independent. They're personal beings. In fact, if you use the same method we use for the personality of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a person because uh, he has power of thought and speech and action. He has feelings. We call that personality. Demons are personal beings. They're independent. Uh, another thing about them, they're bodiless. They're incorporeal. They're, they're, uh, they love. They, they don't like to be out of a body. They like to get into animals and into people. And, and uh, In fact, while you're in Luke, look at chapter 11. It talks about that in verse 24. It says, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finding none he says I will return where I came from and when he comes he finds it swept and put in order that's that's when you just go through you know the 12 steps and you rehabilitate yourself from whatever your illness is and you don't get Christ you're empty swept and garnished but there's no power inside you're just rehabbed and look what happens the next verse says and after that verse 26 then he goes and takes with him, this is the demon, seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. See, if you just rehab people and never give them the gospel and they're never turned from darkness to light, they're prey for worse things, and it's horrible. Demons are bodiless. By the way, they're convinced. Did you know there are no atheist demons? You know, I chuckle every time I hear, you know, this, the president of the Christian University of Oregon uh, student body, it was in the news this week, came out as an atheist. And I thought, great, you know, that's great, you know, great, thanks for telling the news media that. But there are no atheist demons. Why? They all believe. They're all believers. They know who Jesus is. They know that he is the son of the living God. They saw his miracles. They saw him rise from the dead. They shake. They're not saved. See, James warns about people that go to church that have demon faith. That means they believe all the facts. They've just never been transformed. If you've never been saved from sin, you've never been saved from hell. You understand that? Jesus came to destroy the power, the hold, the grip, the, the complete abandonment to the will of the devil. He destroys that and transforms us into his kingdom. There are a lot of people that just know the facts. They just never met Jesus Christ personally and been changed. Demons are convinced. They're supernatural. Remember chapter 8? They can pull off the, the bondage. They're also malignant. They're harmful. It's amazing if you read about what some of these uh, demons do in Mark chapter 9. A man said, my son is possessed with a demon. It makes him mute so they can make people mute. Whenever the demon seizes him, it dashes him to the ground. He foams at the mouth and he grinds his teeth. Demons are very harmful beings. But they're scared to death of Jesus Christ. And they know that he, greater is he that is in you, the scriptures tell us, than he that is in the world, any of Satan's minions. Well, let's, let's start applying this positively. We only have a few minutes to do it. So go from Luke to the book of Acts. Remember, Luke wrote both, inspired and wrote both those. And Acts chapter 19 talks about the church that most confronted demons and the devil and all of that realm. And in chapter 19, I call this God's methodology for church growth. And what's amazing is that what we're going to read this morning in the Word of God is what God has always said is his methodology for growing the church. And it seems like nobody has read any of this because nowadays most churches are involved in what is just a veiled competition. Uh, they're trying to ramp up their program so they can pull people from another church into their church or, or get greater crowds, you know. And I remember when we lived in Tulsa, there was a church that boasted they had 600 pool tables. So they had the largest youth group in Tulsa because they had 600 pool tables in their recreation place. And I thought, amazing. We draw people in with pool tables. That's good. Another church outdid them. They had a, to date it, a Sega Genesis. I mean, what is that, 20 years ago? And, and a seat for every student that came to their youth group. And they could all sit there and blast each other, you know, and they shared screens. And I thought, wow, we have all kinds of ideas to grow our church. How does God grow his church? And it's very clear. It's in Acts 19, verses 17 to 20, and there's two real keys, uh, and I'll, I'll read it to you, starting in verse 17. And this became known to all the Jews and Greeks, 
What became known? Well, it's this little scene that started in verse 11 uh, of the same chapter where uh, Paul is busily sewing his leather work or whatever he did as a tent maker. And, and as he worked, uh, he would sweat and he would take out his handkerchief and go like this and he'd set it on the workbench and he'd get back and he wore this apron so he wouldn't poke himself with the tools and when he went to lunch he'd take the apron off and set it down and he'd go to lunch and people would sneak in his shop and they'd grab his sweat rag and they'd take his apron and if they went around they could heal people. You understand? That's what's going on. It's fascinating to read. And so this, these seven exorcists that weren't Christians, they thought, wow, we're going to add Jesus to our repertoire. I mean, that, I mean, wow, that's great. And so what happens is these itinerant, look at verse 13, they took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. Do you see, you don't have to be a Christian to cast out demons in the name of the Lord Jesus. Like it says in Matthew 7, many will say unto me that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we cast out demons? And Jesus will say, yes, you did, but you never knew me. So this is an example of those who were pretending to know the Lord. And they said to the evil spirits, we exercise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. How do you like that for a secondhand presentation? And then the man with the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus, I know. I mean, I know who God is. I, I know the Holy One of God. And Paul I know. So obviously demons can tell who are Christians. Demons can see that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit, that we belong to God. So this demonized man says, I know who Jesus is and I know who Paul is. Who are you? You are not associated with either one of them. You're not carrying Paul's apron in the name of Christ and his sweat rag and you're not a bearer and, and indweller of Jesus Christ doesn't live in you. And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them one man leaps on seven, overpowered all seven of them, and prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. And this became known both to all the Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus. I mean, it just went all around the city. And fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. All of a sudden, people said, be careful about this Lord Jesus Christ. It's real. It's real. It's real. It's real powerful. It's a real... Per Something's going on there. And they began to have fear. And the name of Christ that was magnified. In other words, people were interested in knowing who Jesus Christ was because he was the one that was real. He was the one that was powerful. He was the one that could overcome. And even the spirits were afraid of him. So it's amazing what happens. Well, keep, keep reading in verse 18. And many of those who believe came confessing and telling their deeds. So as soon as Jesus' name was magnified, the saints began to get consecrated. Those who believed, who had believed, these people are already believers. They came confessing and telling their deeds, and many of those who practiced, who had practiced, see this is their former life, magic brought their books together, burned them in the sight of all, and they counted the value of them, and a total of 50,000 pieces of silver. What is going on there? The church is getting consecrated. They're saying, hey, we don't want anything to do with, with the kingdom of darkness, with the devil, with evil, with, with all that, that, that our former life. We were saved. We, we turn from darkness to light. We turn from the power of Satan to God. We receive forgiveness of sins. We don't want any part of that old life. Reminds me of when Bonnie and I moved, when we were on staff with MacArthur, we went up to New England, and I pastored a historic 165-year-old church. The pastor just prior to me had been an evangelist to Roman Catholics, and he had built the church on door-to-door. -door, uh, Rhode Island is the most Roman Catholic state, even more than Mary's land. Uh, it's 98%, you know, Roman Catholics, dense. And so he just went door-to-door -door leading Roman Catholics to Christ. And the church had really grown, but he realized that there was a real hindrance. And it was like there was something holding back the church. It, people had gotten saved, but they weren't growing. They weren't hungry for the word. And so he began visiting these homes, and he found they still had all their little, you know, on their dashboard, Saint whoever, to keep them safe driving, and around their necks, Saint whoever, to keep them safe traveling. And, and, you know, this little thing over the kitchen table so they could, during their prayer, look up at Mary or whatever it was. And they had these, all this stuff. And their beads, you know, and they were... 
they just didn't know what to do with all that stuff. And it was holding them back. The idolatry of Romanism was holding them back. So he preached through this passage. And during his sermon, he wheeled in in front of the communion table a 55-gallon metal drum. He said, we're having communion tonight. Before you partake in the communion of the Lord Jesus Christ, you need to renounce anything you have of idolatry, paganism, any images you have, any things you hold hoping for spiritual benefit from holding those or praying to them or looking at them or feeling them or having you know, them around. He said, bring them. And he said, we're going to burn them tonight. It was the turning point in the church. When we got there, they had planted 21 churches in greater Providence area because the people renounced they brought, look, look at verse 19, they brought all that stuff that was magical and burned them in the sight of all. They didn't sell them on eBay, by the way. <laughs> so someone else could be ensnared by it. They destroyed anything they had to do with Satan and evil and idolatry and everything else. And look what happens in verse 20. The word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. Okay. Lesson number one, Paul taught that to magnify God, we have to divest ourselves of anything tied to Satan, to demons, to occultic activity, to magical black arts. We have to renounce, not just say it, we have to get rid of it in our life. Did you know many Christians are held back from fully serving the Lord because they have things that, that are hidden in their life, hidden to everyone but, of course, God. And the Spirit of God is grieved because when he looks at us, he sees what we are choosing to hide, to hold on to, to cherish more than him. Because we know that that displeases him, but, but it has a hold on us. Paul said, you must renounce the darkness. And that was a turning point for that church. Then he says, we, we have to use God's weapons. And we studied this uh, two times ago, but you know the passage. We have to know that we have the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness and our loins girt about with truth and we have to have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace and we have to have the sword of the spirit. That means we don't trust someone else, you know, our favorite elder to know the verse. We should know the scripture that we need to defend ourselves and that's the sword of the spirit. And our spiritual weapons are not humanly invented. These are spiritually uh, empowered. And then James said, and if you want to turn to James chapter 4, I mean this one is very specific. In James chapter 4, the order that the Lord gives us is astounding. He says that we must submit to God and submission to God precedes any ability for us to resist the devil. And what James said is, therefore submit yourselves to God. That's first. It must be first. Then, look what it says in verse 7, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. You understand that, that spiritual warfare starts with submission to God. It starts with, with a bowing before the one who bought us and owns us and we submit to him. It continues, Peter said, and if you're, if you're in James 4, just turn across the page to 1 Peter chapter 5, and look what Peter says in verse 5. Likewise, you younger people, submit to your elders. Yes, all of you, be submissive to one another. Be clothed with humility. Do you see that? Peter said, to resist Satan, we must not only submit to God, but we have to live humbly. You know, we live in the proudest society of all. We, we trumpet ourselves, show off. I mean, it's just the social media has become show myself and in so many ways. And it's just the human flesh feeds on that. God says, you want to resist Satan? You got to start living humbly in God's sight. We're to clothe ourselves with humility before we can resist. Only humble people can resist the devil. And finally, John said this, and as long as you're going, it's right past 1 Peter and 2 Peter. We get to 1 John 3, verses 7 through 9. And this is what John says. He says, not only do we live submissively and humbly and renounce the darkness and use the spiritual warfare, but we live holy in God's sight to resist Satan. And our, our lives are only as powerful as our purity in God's sight. And that's why 
Everyone who has this hope, 1 John 3, 3 says, who has this hope in himself purifies himself just as he is pure. We have to renounce all the sins of the flesh and of the spirit. We have to, by purifying, that means we get rid of. We, remember Jesus said, you've already been washed, but now you have to wash, just your, the washing the feet was saying as we go through life, we get defiled. There are, it's almost like we're, we're always splashing up the mud of the world and we're totally cleansed by the Holy Spirit, but we, by our contact with the world, have to purify and say, Lord, I renounce uh, those thoughts, those images, those things, those words, those feelings. I ask for your cleansing so that I don't grieve your spirit. It's amazing how powerful a pure life can be and how disabling impurity is. So, Basically, we're supposed to monitor our own spiritual immune system. We have to have spiritual health. You go see a doctor, the doctor says, how are you doing, uh, the, what are you eating? Are you eating right? Are you getting enough rest? Are you exercising? You know, most Americans have very sedentary lives. Come on, eat less, exercise more. Did you know that's what church is supposed to be like? We're supposed to be asking everybody around us, how are you doing eating and drinking God's word? Are you exercising every day in the spirit? Are you reading this thing? Are you doing it? What verse are you memorizing? If you're building your sword of the Spirit, what, what one have you added to your sword this week? Do you have any sword? Did you know that's what you do when you come to church? You don't come and say, hey, are you going to potluck? I'm going to potluck. Oh boy, boy, do you have a new car? I have a new car. Are your kids graduating? My kids are graduating. See you later. Where's the spiritual health stuff? We're all supposed to be exhorting one another and so much the more as we see that day approaching. It's not the elders they are supposed to be running around like chickens with their heads cut off trying to talk to every person. It's the saints talking to each other and edifying one another and encouraging one another. That's our spiritual health. And secondly, our spiritual armor. We're supposed to understand and use the armor. And there's supposed to be testimonies of people saying how, how they have resisted and how they have found the, that the weapons of our warfare work. The, instead of just hearing lessons about it, lectures about it, we're supposed to hear testimonies about it. That's what we gather for. That's what church is about. It's not Sega Genesis and video games and 600 pool tables and we have more than you. It's we're walking in the spirit and we're seeing him at work in our lives. And then we start resisting the devil and we don't ignore him and we're not afraid of him. We go into his territory and we resist him. That's what so much of missions is about, is going into the darkness as a light. Well, our call is to consecrated living. Acts 19, if you look at it, basically has three parts. First, God's Son is magnified in verse 17. Then God's people get consecrated and start clearing out the trash. And then God's word prevails. That's how God builds a church. Hold up Christ. God's people start following him, then God's word prevails through them. So, I like this. I, in fact, I clipped it and put it in for you. This is what uh, a fellow that I've never met, but I've only read his books, wrote on this passage. He said, what would be burned today if the Spirit's conviction swept our church? I mean, if God really swept through us, I think some DVDs that have things that grieve the Holy Spirit no matter whether they cost $20 or not, would be gotten rid of. Uh, magazines, videos, uh, and quietly removed from, from out of the way desk drawers? No, probably removed from hard drives and servers and things like that. Who has a solid copy of anything these days? Certain novels, perhaps some television shows or movies or websites or radio stations and video games would be boycotted by the person because they say, I don't want to do anything that, that draws the devil and his demons and grieves. I mean, what a double jeopardy that is. Do something that grieves the Holy Spirit of God that seals us and do something that draws the enemy. And that's what all these things do. Television shows, movies, websites, radio stations, video games that have gratuitous bloodshed. God says Christians aren't supposed to look at bloodshed, even if it is pixelated. We are never to get used to bloodshed. It's amazing how Satan is deadening a whole generation with saying it's just a game. If it's just a game, why don't you stop? If it's not important, why don't you stop? How, how come kids are dropping out of school because they can't stop playing the games? Because they're addicted to bloodshed. 
Well, some, how did I get off? I'm reading, I'm sorry, I get preaching here. Some people would ask others to pray that they would be set free from whatever is dragging them down. That's what the church is supposed to be. We're supposed to come in and say, I'm really struggling this week. You know, if, if someone's car breaks down, we, we rush to their rescue, but when people's spiritual car breaks down, we don't even know. See, we have to say, I need help. Pray for me. Come alongside of me. And many would come to Christ for forgiveness of sin and deliverance from the eternal wrath of God. Why? Because the church, when Christ is magnified, when Christians start getting consecrated, the word of God prevails in their life and through them. So basically this. The power of consecration is this. The power of the early church was simply they had genuine holiness. They didn't just talk it, they lived it. They were energized by grace, so they magnified Christ. God's word prevailed in their life and then out of their lives into others. They lived a consecrated life. The spirit of God moved unhindered, flowed unquenched, and God got all the glory. No one was competing for the credit. No one sought to be in control. And God reigned, and the spirit moved, and Christ was magnified. I wondered this morning, is that describe your life or is there something that needs to go in the 55-gallon drum and get destroyed and you renounce what displeases God? Well, a good way to start on all that is to stand up. So let's all stand up. I'm scaring you now, right? Uh, someone asked me, they said, when's the next time you're having a walk down the aisle invitation? I said, well, not this week. You know, because everyone would think that uh, you have some satanic stuff in your house. So we're not going to do that. But what I thought is it starts by magnifying Christ and submitting to him. And this little chorus is an invitation, kind of like sending out an invitation to a party, you know. It's an RSVP. And, and asking the Lord to respond and saying, Lord, I want you, uh, look at the words, melt me. You know, I get cold, I get distant, I'm kind of, you know, not like as fervent as I used to be. I want you to melt me, bring me back, that mold me, I've gotten conform to this world. Squash me back into your shape. Fill me. I'm so empty. I, I just feel so far from you. So you can use me. And that only happens not by me reading a couple more verses, picking up another service or another Bible study. It's only the Spirit of God. When I don't grieve him and when I don't invite his enemies into my life. So I renounce that and I submit to him and s surrender to his control. And you can do that by singing this song. And let's sing it together as our closing prayer to the Lord. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. before him father in heaven I pray that any renouncing of the darkness any destruction of those reminders of the evil one and of his wickedness would take place in our lives that we would say I don't want anything to impede your spirit and your word prevailing so that Christ will be magnified in and through my life and Lord, I pray for anybody that this morning just needs help. They just need to talk to someone. That you would bring them as the elders and our godly women are here with your word open, ready to pray, ready to minister, that no one who needs to get a fresh start today would depart without starting again anew and afresh with you. And for all of us, I pray that we would examine our lives and decide what displeases you and consciously as an act of worship get rid of that and say I do this in the name of Jesus because I want you to fill me 
and use me for your glory. Thank you for meeting with us. Change us into your image, we pray. In the precious name of Jesus and all of God's people said, amen. God bless you as you go.